Hey, I'm Rachel, and this is my first attempt at doing a natural history true crime video where I'm going to tell a story about a crime that happened that somehow connects to natural history or actual history. These types of stories, I think, are mainly just for people who are interested in crime, interested in learning something, and don't really want a lot of vicious murder. I mean, there may be some, but not today. There will be no vicious murder today. So how this is gonna work is I'm going to tell a true crime story that has to do with natural history. And while doing that, I might, you know, be making some things, uh, which I will then film later, uh, just to give you something else to look at besides my beautiful face. And at the end, we will have some type of narrative scene thing. I don't know. I have a vision. We'll see how it turns out. So today's story is about four college guys who tried to commit a rare book heist. This story was turned into the 2018 movie American Animals. Look at that gorgeous cover. But because most natural history, true crime related stories, if they're ever told at all, are usually told through books, I'm gonna be sticking with the book version of this story, also called American Animals, by one of the guys that committed the crime, Eric Borsick. Also, great cover art. Another reason I'm sticking with Eric's side of the story is that clearly the then young men had very differing perspectives of the events that happened, which the movie does a good job kind of showing, um, which isn't surprising that they all don't remember very well because they were on a ton of drugs. So we're going to stick with Eric's perspective. I just want to preface this and say I'm not a huge fan. These young men did not revere what they were stealing. This was not a Robin Hood situation. They didn't really want to stick it to John James Audubon, who was a raging racist. They were not trapped in poverty and stealing this was not their means of getting out of poverty. My point is, is I don't root for any of these guys. They're kind of dead. Besides that, I will try to bury my annoyance and save it for the end. The story starts in 2004 when Eric is a freshman and accounting major at Kentucky University. That's wrong. At the University of Kentucky. In the middle of the night, he gets a message on his phone from his estranged buddy Warren. Now, Warren Lipka has been friends with Eric since childhood, and they had recently had a falling out when Warren thought that Eric stole money from him from their joint fake ID making business. But Eric gets this voicemail from Warren saying, he has a project he's working on and he needs to meet up with Eric and tell him about it. At the end of the voicemail, Warren quotes French medieval poet and criminal Francois Villon by saying, In my own country, I am in a far off land. I am strong but have no power. I win all yet remain a loser. At break of day, I say good night. When I lie down, I have great fear of falling. So the two meet at a restaurant on campus and Warren sits him down and says, Spencer, their other friend, Spencer and I have been working on something, but before I tell you anything, I need to know you're in. And Eric says, yeah, sure, I'm in. Okay. Then Warren tells him what's going on. He says, I just got back from Amsterdam. I flew over there on a fake passport that I got from our friend, you know, the guy. Spencer and I are gonna rob the rare books room at Transy. My dealer in Amsterdam wants Audubon's Birds of America, which he thinks I already have. It could be worth $10 million. After the heist, we'll take the loot to Europe. We may be on the run. We may never be able to return. We may never see our families again. So this all started when Spencer Reinhardt, an art student, went on a class tour of Transylvania University's rare books room. This is also in Kentucky, near the University of Kentucky. During the tour, the class was shown one of the copies of Birds of America, which caught Spencer's eye even more so when he heard that it could be worth as much as $12 million. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the books for a minute because I think it's important. Channel is about natural history, so let's learn about natural history. So Birds of America, 
was written and illustrated by John James Audubon. He's kind of a big deal and you've likely definitely heard of the Audubon Society named after him. Audubon was a naturalist, ornithologist, and painter who lived from 1785 to 1851. Born in Haiti, he spent much of his life living in Kentucky while also traveling throughout the rest of North America and Europe. His goal was to paint every bird species in North America, with his efforts resulting in his color-plated book, Birds of America, which is considered one of the finest ornithological works in history. It was really just huge in terms of scientifically, but also literally. Wait a second. Okay. So here I have a poster that is just a smidge smaller than the actual book size. So you can see it is literally huge. Birds of America, which consists of several volumes, has 435 hand-colored prints depicting 700 life-size birds and is about 39 by 26 inches large and weighs around 40 pounds per volume. The cost of printing the books at the time was $2 million in today's money. There are believed to be 120 copies left in existence, with almost all of them being in institutional collections. Several now extinct bird species are depicted, including the passenger pigeon, Carolina parakeet, and great auk. The 490 bird species depicted were the result of 14 years of observation. He also painted some of the natural habitats the birds lived in, which was surprisingly rare at the time. Audubon garnered a lot of status and acclaim in Europe for his work. He went on to influence many naturalists, artists, conservationists, and authors, including Darwin. Today, however, his legacy has not aged well. He was incredibly racist, even for Victorian standards. He bought and sold enslaved people at his trading post in Kentucky, failed to credit the artists and those people that helped him in specimen collections over those 14 years. Most of them were Black and Indigenous people. And despite him being believed to be Black himself, his mother was Haitian, he actively worked against the abolitionist movement. There's a lot more here and a lot to this guy. I encourage you to check out one of the many wonderful articles written for the Audubon Society, both about its complex history and its namesake. I included a link to one of my favorite articles in the description box. Okay, back to the story. After this meeting between Eric and Warren in the cafe, where Warren talks about his and Spencer's whole plan up until this point, the three of them, Eric, Spencer, and Warren, do some other stuff that's not really important to the plot. I don't know, they hike on the Appalachian Trail for a little bit. So at the start of the fall semester in 2004, Eric and Warren are living in this like university adjacent shithole house you know the ones that have 20 guys living in it. Eric is burdened with caring for somebody's puppy named Dixie. This is somewhat important later. Uh, the house is managed by this guy named Chas Allen, who the book and movie really paint as a huge douche. And he paints himself that way too. But Warren's bedroom is in the corner of the basement and the guys decide to board up a corner of that room, make it look like a false wall to hide their loot. They cover that hole with a bookshelf and some National Geographics, and it's just like a little hidey hole. The guys start to get to work with their plan. Spencer, who goes to Transylvania University, what they call transy, Spencer uses his birding binoculars because he's not just an art student, he's a bird nerd and he uses them to spy on the Transy Library. Spencer has been devising a lot of bird-themed projects for his classes, so he got permission from the art department to visit the Rare Books room to photograph pages of Birds of America. He got a few of these special tours where he was able to observe the security measures. He was always helped by an older librarian named Betty. Betty was nice enough to show Spencer other books they housed that they would later decide to steal along with Birds of America. Through these tours, Spencer saw how the staff elevator worked, the rare book room security keypad, that there were no alarms in the room, if a piece was removed, and there weren't any cameras. And because there was a more robust building security system used at night, they would have to rob the place during the day, with the only thing being left to stand in their way was an older woman who would let them in with a scheduled appointment. The three boys used the library computers to contact Warren's 
dealer in Amsterdam. They post in the email and in instances throughout the planning and execution of their heist as a man named Mr. Beekman. And as Mr. Beekman, they emailed the Amsterdam dealer to let them know that in addition to Birds of America, that they have decided that they would let go a few other books in their collection. They included the photos Spencer had taken in the rare books room to prove that they had these books in their possession already. Warren tells the guys that later on the dealer did reply and said he was interested in the other books. The other books they planned to steal were Hortus Santitas de la Ten and Francois, two volumes, 450 woodcut illustrations, Paris circa 1500, illuminated manuscripts, devotional calendar, England circa 1425, and first edition on the origin of species by means of natural selection by Charles Darwin. So three additional books along with Birds of America. The day of their planned heist was quickly approaching. The weeks leading up to when they planned to do the heist, they called the library often and scheduled appointments as Mr. Beekman and then wouldn't show up. Instead, they would place themselves throughout the library to observe if anything was done differently, if there were security changes, anything when a tour is scheduled. For weeks, they continued to stake out the library, planting themselves in different places, pretending to study. Eric pretends to read Ulysses during these stakeouts. They observe employees' schedules and habits and sketch layouts. They walk through employee-only doors, pretending to be lost students in order to map the building accurately. And they mistakenly walk through the exit doors only to test if the alarm will sound as the signs claim they do, but they don't. One day while they're hanging out and getting high, Eric turns to the guys and says, even if I knew we were gonna get caught, I would still go on with the heist. The others were confused by this, like getting caught hadn't even crossed their minds apparently. But Eric suggests that they come up with a code word for if things go wrong and they need to pull the plug on this. He suggests Dixie's dead, which is the name of the house dog. Like if one of them called the other, they would say, I'm sorry to inform you that Dixie is dead. She was hit by a car, which would actually mean stop everything you're doing. The heist is off or compromised or go to our hiding spot, whatever. So the guys continued to prepare their supplies for the upcoming heist. Old people prosthetics, zip ties, and a stun gun that they planned to use on the librarian Betty. They practiced tasing each other and tying each other up, having a good old time LARPing, assaulting someone, and committing a crime. What fun. Their original plan of getting a getaway car fell through. So they reluctantly approached their house manager, Chas. And this guy really liked gangster movies. And when he heard the money at stake, he was eager to join in with the group. Eric clearly really hates this guy and none of them really trust him, but they need a getaway driver, so. So the morning of the heist arrives and all the guys are getting ready, which includes donning their disguises because what heist is complete without disguises? Wow, I really killed it. They did the whole shebang. Wigs, glasses, vintage suits, latex, fake noses. They really thought they were hot. You think this looks bad? It is clear that they thought that they were really freaking clever. So Chas arrives with the van and they switch plates and they head over to the Transy Library. Somehow when they pulled into the library parking lot, they were shocked that it was full of people. It was exam week before Christmas break. What do you expect? They decided to continue on with their plan totally fine. And all four of them walk up to the library and as they go through the door, a student holds the door open for them and does a double take and laughs to himself because these four are clearly not old men. So as they enter the library, all eyes are on them. Everyone looked up from their books and are staring at them. And not just that, as Warren goes up the stairs to check into the rare book room, he sees that Betty is not there. There's some other librarian that he doesn't know. And he panics and runs back down the stairs. Four of them are huddled around and they're arguing with each other. They don't know if they should continue. And a crowd starts to form around them. People think that they're about to witness a prank. The movie doesn't really play it like this. They just kind of like chicken out. 
but it was clear they made a spectacle of themselves with their disguises. Uh, so they call it off and they all go home and most of them seem to be pretty relieved. It was fun to plan a heist, but now they can get away scot-free. They didn't do anything wrong. Everything's good. A lot of them go about their business. They go to their exams. Uh, Eric visits his family. And when they all get back to their communal house, Warren gathers them in the basement and says, okay, I emailed Betty. I wanted to apologize for missing our appointment, but get this, apparently she missed it too. A personal matter or something. So I rescheduled the appointment for tomorrow. They were feeling pretty bad about their failed attempt the day before, so the next day they decided to nix the disguises, which were clearly a liability, and just go in kind of as themselves. They changed themselves a little bit, their appearance, and that's really as good as it, as it could get. This time they also decided to change things. Instead of all four of them entering the library, this time Chas would wait in the getaway vehicle in the parking lot. Spencer would plant himself on the building across the street with binoculars to have a good vantage point and Eric and Warren would enter the library. Now the plan was for Warren to go up and enter the rare books room for the appointment. Eric had planned to wait downstairs while Warren took care of Betty and then called Eric up to help with the books. Eric was clearly very uncomfortable with the thought of being involved in any way with subduing Betty, despite the fact that he's involved with this, so he is he is involved in hurting her. He just didn't want to be directly involved in hurting her. So at the bottom of the stairs, they part ways, Eric sits down with his book Ulysses, and Warren walks up and, you know, buzzes in, and Betty comes and lets him in the rare books room. A few minutes later, Eric gets a call on his cell phone. It's Warren. Warren says, hey buddy, want to come on up? Eric asks if everything is okay. Warren reassures him and tells him to come up. Eric climbs the stairs and comes up to the door and sees inside that Betty is up and walking around. He panics. That's not what was supposed to happen. Warren was already supposed to have subdued her and tied her up. She welcomes Eric in by saying, Mr. Beekman tells me you are an Audubon admirer as well. She's smiling, she's shaking his hand, he's wearing leather gloves, which is odd and she definitely notices. Betty kindly begins giving the boys a tour. Warren shoots Eric a look and then quickly wraps his arms around Betty and whispers something into her ear and then tases her. Betty obviously screams, but no one can really hear her because this uh, special room is really cut off from the rest of the library. Warren has her on the ground and keeps saying to her, we don't want to hurt you, we're just here for the books. Eric is choking. He's not moving, he's freaking out about being involved in this part, and Warren keeps yelling at him like, get her legs, tie her up, uh, so Eric eventually like disassociates from the moment and does what Warren says as Warren begins to unlock the cabinets and haul out the Audubons. Now you may recall that uh, Birds of America is huge. Probably wouldn't have been my first choice to steal, to just walk out of a library full of people with a 40 pound book, more than one of them. But this is how they thought they were gonna do it. They brought a giant bed sheet and laid it on the ground and lifted the Audubon volumes out and put it on this bed sheet and wrapped it up. They proceeded to go to the other cabinets and grab the other books that they had planned on stealing as well, including that first edition of Origin of Species, which I did look it up. I love that. I want one of those. Yeah, it's very expensive. The only way to get one is, is to steal it. They placed the smaller books inside their backpacks and had the Audubons wrapped up in the sheet. They together hoisted these books, wrapped up very carelessly, and walked over to the employee elevator and hit the lobby level. When the doors opened, a clearly library employee with a clipboard was walking by. She turned, looked at the guys, it took her a moment, and then she realized what was happening. She yelled at them to stop, they hit that button, 
For the basement level, the doors closed. In the basement, they reassessed for a minute and assumed that the librarian had ran upstairs to check on Betty. So they hit the button for the elevator and went back up to the lobby. And sure enough, no one was there. They hoisted the books and made a mad, awkward dash to the library front doors. Then they heard someone yell behind them, turned around and looked, and that employee was at the top of the stairs having checked on Betty. Everyone froze. The lady at the top of the stairs screamed, what the hell are you doing? They're stealing the books. And frozen with fear, the guys dropped the Audubons. They were right at the door and they just dropped the Audubons and ran. Chas swung the car around when he saw them and the guys jumped in and they peeled out of that parking lot, flipping that woman as she chased them out of the library. They flew down streets in a pre-planned route. They had lost Birds of America, a $12 million book. We didn't get them, they yelled at Chas, who was asking what happened. Warren pulls his head back into the car after puking out the window and says, the backpacks, the backpacks. They look inside their backpacks and find that they did manage to get away with a few goodies. The first edition, Origin of Species, and medieval volumes called Hortus Santitas. Sanitatis. I took Latin once. I remember nothing. Chas dumps Warren and Eric by a warehouse and leaves to switch out cars while the two boys stash the books and their clothing in trash bags, hiding them for later, and then they flee the scene. Over the phone, Spencer relays what happened after the three left the library from his lookout across the street. Campus security came and eventually, much later, the police arrived. Later, Chas, who went and got a different vehicle, picks them up. They drove back to the warehouse to retrieve the books and their bagged up belongings, which they deposited in dumpsters around the city and the books they put in their little hidey hole in Warren's bedroom. And then they finished off the week by completing their exams. The next day, Warren emailed his buyer in Amsterdam, regretting to inform him that Birds of America was no longer available. The dealer was upset and distrusting, thinking that they had made a deal for that book. And so the dealer wanted assurances from Mr. Beekman that the books that were remaining were legit. So he requests that they get appraised. Without consulting the rest of the group, Warren went ahead and made an appointment to get the books appraised at Christie's, like one of the most prestigious auction houses in the world. The books would be appraised in New York City in three days. So the gang piled into their car and drove the 10 or 11 hours, if I had to guess, to New York City. They do some touristy things, party, Eric gets really messed up and wanders the city, and the next day is the appointment. Now, clearly having learned nothing about keeping a low profile uh, in favor of enacting scenes they've seen from heist movies, they dress like idiots. All four walked to Christie's and waited outside. They were all dressed in black suits, black trench coats, black gloves, sunglasses, and were intently guarding a black rolling suitcase in which they had the books. They were being super shady and shifty-eyed. Eric said that it was clear that a lot of people were alarmed by this shifty group of men that were loitering in public and looking very suspicious in New York City three years after, you know, just dressed like normal people. Stop copying what you see in movies. Warren and Spencer enter Christie's without the books and get all the way back there. The main appraiser couldn't make it, but they do meet a few other people who ask to see the books. Like, so weird that they didn't bring them in with them. So they call Eric and Chas, and the other two go back to the entrance and meet them and do a really shady, like, like switch off with the suitcase, which definitely garnered some attention from Christie's staff. Because remember, they're like 18, 19 years old. They look like kids and they're acting really weird. So the main woman they met with named Melanie said that because the main appraiser wasn't there, she would pass the note she took along and someone would be in touch with them about the final appraisal paperwork in a few weeks. Once Warren and Spencer came back outside from their appointment, they all met up again, did not speak to each other and just like weirdly walked to Central Park. Warren told them what had happened inside and then Chas asked uh, an important question. How are they gonna contact you? Spencer said, I gave them my phone number. Genius. They had been so 
careful in some ways. And now that there was a phone number directly linking them with stolen books, they're screwed. Spencer said he hadn't had time to react when they asked for a phone number to contact them and he just spit out his personal phone number. Chas freaked out. Spencer feels terrible. Warren is taking it pretty quietly. It kind of is what it is now. But Chas keeps yelling at Spencer to go back and take that number and give them a different one. Like that wouldn't be suspicious at all. It's clear this is a big deal, but there's nothing to be done at this point. They drive back to Kentucky in silence and they all know that they're pretty much screwed at this point. So they all return home from New York City and they store the books back in their hiding place and the spring semester of school begins. They all seem to be living in a state of dread and paranoia. They try to live normally, but they're all clearly spiraling. Warren got arrested for shoplifting and Eric gets in a weird scuffle with police where he gets beat up for no reason, I don't know. And I guess they're barely speaking to each other, kind of just waiting to hear back either from Christie's or to get a knock at the door. Warren and Spencer started a half-hearted plan to make a run for Europe uh, once the semester was over. But Eric seemed pretty resigned to whatever was gonna happen next. The knock came late one night in February 2005 as an FBI SWAT team busted down their doors. Apparently Melanie at Christie's was suspicious and Spencer's phone number did do them in, along with Warren having used the alias and email address for Mr. Beekman for both the heist at the museum and scheduling the appointment that led to the heist, and they used that name and email address in contact with Christie's. All four were arrested and the books were recovered undamaged. So that's where the book ends. All four pleaded guilty to federal charges, including theft of cultural artifacts from a public museum and transportation of stolen property. They weren't prosecuted for the assault of Betty, however, thanks to the stun gun not being deemed a dangerous weapon. She could have had a heart attack. You know, the emotional damage Betty endured was pretty sad though. The personal thing that made her miss the meeting they had scheduled for the day before the heist was her getting ready to put her mother into hospice, which she ended up having to do the day after the heist. Uh, when she was pretty traumatized. An article by Seattle Times, the only source I could find for Betty's point of view, explained that, quote, the trauma came not just from being tied up and threatened, but the added violations of two sacred things, the workplace she regarded as a home and the special relationship she had teaching students about so many of Transy's treasures. Betty spoke kindly of the 2018 film in which she appeared in very briefly. She said of the film, what came across was a very human desire to leave a mark on the world. But these young men, they went about it all the wrong way. They came from good families. They wanted excitement. They wanted to be known for something big. Spencer makes the remark that artists need to suffer. It's a very human desire to want to be considered unique. It's difficult to feel sympathy, but I'm working on it. That, that is so nice of her to feel that way when they do not deserve that. They were bored and she suffered years of trauma over this experience. All four of the guys were equally sentenced to seven years in prison. They're all out and living their lives now. Eric is a writer, obviously, and lives in LA. Spencer still lives in Kentucky and has a family and is professionally an artist specializing in birds. Warren is a film student and Chas is a personal trainer in LA as well. And he has also written several books about his Crimes. The book and movie plant substantial doubt in Warren's side of the story. The other guys question if he ever even went to Amsterdam at all, if there was ever a dealer, or if Warren had fabricated this whole thing just to do something exciting. The other guys aren't really sure. The authorities don't know if Warren's sides and his plans were actually real, which is weird that there's so much distrust because these guys are all still kind of friends. 
um, it honestly seems like they got what they wanted. They wanted fame, um, an interesting story, and they got a movie and a book. Good for them. Okay, my conclusion, my review of this, this book. Good thing about it, I read this all in one day, which would stand to reason it was entertaining. That's the only good thing I have to say about this book. And this book isn't technically poorly written. I just kept comparing it to one of my favorite books, which is The Feather Thief, which is a book also about a museum heist. And it is amazing, but as a standalone, my issues were many. I was really conflicted about reading this book at all, and I told the bookstore clerk when I bought it, I like didn't want to help someone profit off of their crime by buying this book. But I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. I had not looked up the story at all beforehand, I didn't know all the details, I was expecting him to maybe express some remorse, show growth over time, like really rip apart his younger self for being a huge dick and he didn't really that i have determined was probably due to a deliberate structural choice he likely wanted to show what was going through his head at that moment and maybe wanted it to be a capsule of like his younger self's really dumb decisions during this time i just i just didn't like that he does make fun of himself a little bit and the choices they made but he still goes out of his way to make the heist sound more badass than it was he may have tried to make himself look sympathetic at times but i didn't feel that i was also incredibly disappointed because of the mountains of missed opportunity like the feather thief so much could have been shared about the manuscripts they stole or intended to steal that whole spiel I did at the top of this video about Audubon, about the significance of Birds of America, we got none of that in this actual book. We knew nothing about what they were stealing, which I feel is important to know. We need to know the context of what's being stolen. And I don't know, I want to learn something and not just be entertained. The author took maybe two pages towards the end, right before they were busted, to fabricate some half-hearted appreciation for Origin of Species for a second, but it was not convincing and I, I didn't buy it. So the author didn't even say anything about what they were stealing, but he did spend a lot of time talking about things that weren't integral to the plot whatsoever. A whole chapter dedicated to them <clears throat> hiking on the Appalachian Trail, where apparently Spencer thought that the other two were going to murder him. And that came up later for a second and then amounted to nothing. Okay. <laughs> Several pages were dedicated to where the author was on 9-11, which was not really important to me in this story. You know, the story itself was short and he needed filler to make it actually book length. And it's still... A pretty small book and it's just disappointing because there were opportunities he could have talked about the books he could have talked about so much and he chose things that for me were not important clearly there's a lot i didn't like about this um i have no hate for the author i haven't read any of his other stuff and i may just dislike his framing choices and i feel like i would have done it a little differently um, but he did his time, they all did their time, and they likely regret what they did. But again, he and his friends did profit off of the movie and the books, and they got the fame and interesting story that they did this whole thing for in the first place. Uh, maybe I would have felt better about it if I had gotten what I would wanted, which was actual information instead of just shallow entertainment, but... From a natural history standpoint, this is not an educational book. 
like some of the other natural history true crime books out there. It's just a tale of entitled privileged frat boys who just wanted to emulate cool movies and assaulted an innocent woman just so that they could feel something. Uh, to be fair, I like the movie better uh, and it made the men who committed the heist more human and they did express remorse. So I recommend the movie. Uh, it is available for free on Hulu. Uh, thank you for getting through this with me. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying. I'll see how I feel about this and how you, potential viewer, feel about it. And if I decide to continue or maybe just go on TikTok and share my recommended reading list and spare people a half hour long explanation of a book. And this was even a short book. Uh, let me know what you thought of this story, if you read the book, what you thought of the book, what you thought of the movie, if you have book recommendations, and please let me know how I can improve these videos.